గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ థ్యాంక్ యూ అందరికీ ప్రాక్టీస్ చేసారు ఇప్పటిదాకా ఎట్లా చెప్పాలి వెల్ ఐ నోటీస్ వన్ థింగ్ ఎర్లియర్ ఇన్ ఎనీ ఫార్మల్ సెటప్ వెన్ అ పర్సన్ వాజ్ స్పీకింగ్ అండ్ ఇఫ్ సంబడీ వుడ్ లుక్ ఎట్ ద టెలిఫోన్ ఇట్ వాస్ కన్సిడర్ టు బి రూడ్ బట్ నౌ వెన్ సంబడీ ఈస్ లుకింగ్ ఎట్ ద సెల్ ఫోన్ వైల్ యూఆర్ స్పీకింగ్ యూఆర్ జస్ట్ హోపింగ్ ద ట్వీటింగ్ అండ్ రీట్వీటింగ్ అండ్ యూ నో డూయింగ్ వాట్ నాట్ సో ది ఎంటైర్ సెటప్ హస్ చేంజ్డ్ ఐ బిలీవ్ విత్ ది advent of social media so happy to be here so happy to see such young faces uh, and very energetic that too and pratik thank you so much for having all of us here to have this uh, very important conversation bridge india i hope uh, really brings about many more such conversations to the table good luck to you uh, virendra sharma ji the most senior member of the parliament and always has been a friend of india as uh, manju ji called him father of all the indian communities here uh, we've literally seen uh, viren sharma ji take the effort to travel to india to have the discussions with various state heads various member of parliaments because not many people do that you know to take that extra step and put that extra effort to actually go to ground see people meet people i truly appreciate your friendship uh, towards the causes that india takes up sir thank you so much and uh, Manju Shaul Hamid councilor former mayor thank you so much i heard you were a fiery speaker and a person who has no iota of fear in you and you speak your mind uh, please keep rocking keep doing that thank you so much for being here today and um, uday nagraju uh, founder of uh, ai policy labs and uh, hopefully we'll see you in parliament of uk sometime you are from my land proud proud of you that you are able to make certain inroads into the political system here um dr niro agujabo uh, breaking all the barriers he is the first uh, how do i address it politically colored or african american african american um formal special advisor to uk prime minister honorable theresa may i'm very happy that you are here and hopefully we'll get to speak and discuss on various other issues uh, thank you so much and the occasion today is uh, that india has passed a revolutionary bill which we are hoping that will bring many 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 more women into the parliament today of course the number is at 78 with the passage of the bill we are hoping that 181 more women will join the parliament first of all as our custom and as our tradition goes whoever worked for this bill starting from Uh, honorable deva gowda ji in 1996 to honorable sonia gandhi ji in 2010 and to shri honorable narendra modi ji in uh, 2024 i sincerely thank all of them from the bottom of my heart to making this bill a reality uh, this is not just politics but this is the respect these people have shown to the women of this uh, great nation uh, we are the most populous country today we are the world's largest democracy and uh, if we were to leave half of our population at home it was certainly not going to help our country and we realized that all the parties realized that all the all of the leadership realized that so that is how i believe this bill became a reality and in fact uh, we just it's very interesting to know a little bit about uh, the background towards this bill while the constitution was being created in the 1950s after the british left us in 1947 during the 1950 constitutional debates many women leaders like sarojini naidu many of them in fact said we don't need quota for women you know we fought shoulder to shoulder with you during the independence movement and we will survive in the political arena and we will uh, come into the parliaments and assemblies so they refused to have quotas because the quotas for the marginalized sections like scheduled castes scheduled tribes was discussed and it became a part of indian constitution in 1950 when we uh, in, uh, you know enacted the constitution so women then uh, were so confident because they were a part of the indian independence movement so they refused they said we don't need quotas well uh, that <laughs> feel good factor faded away very quickly by 1970s when women realized that okay we are not being given any positions in any of the political parties no member of parliaments no women um, you know making space into assemblies etc 
Then the discussion started that maybe women should get quotas. So from 1970s in India, there has been this constant discussion. And 1972, I believe, is a year when United Nations uh, theme of that year was to discuss the condition of women in India. So for the first time, I believe, government, the then government of India uh, did an extensive survey on the condition of women in India. At that point of time, more and more women leaders, more and more men and parties realized that not enough attention is being given to women's issues. It could be health, it could be education, it could be political participation, it could be economical participation. So that is when the Honorable Geeta Mukherjee ji and the whole of the CPI, CPM party, they had a major role to play, uh, especially the AIDWA, AIDWA, All India Democratic Women's Association. So they did play a great role. So it's not about one single party playing the role. It is about every leader realizing, understanding that unless and until we carry our women with us, we're not going to progress. Well, the advocacy continued from 1970s to, and it was uh, constantly there. Many women did a lot of dharnas. Uh, even in my district headquarters, I could remember in my constituency in Nizamabad, in 1990s, many women uh, did the dharna. But the then governments did not uh, move. I mean, we could not move that uh, needle somehow. In 1996, I'm very proud there was a coalition government. When Deva Gaudaji first became the prime minister, he said, let me make this effort. Let me bring the women's reservation bill. He tried. Then subsequently, Vajpayee ji tried. Then Sonia ji tried. Ultimately, in 2024, now this bill has become a reality. Well, now it is called uh, Nari Shakti Vandan Abhiyan. It is the 128th uh, amendment to the Indian constitution, which brings this bill into force. And I believe uh, for the future generations, 19th and 20th of September is going to remain the most important date for uh, you, you know women bill that was passed. And uh, interestingly enough, as, an in, as Indian custom goes, any, anything that we start, we usually start it with the sisters or the mothers of the house by uh, doing the uh, puja or taking the first step. So the new parliament building was made in India, a huge building, a new one. And the very first bill that is passed in that building is the Women's Reservation Bill. I'm very, very proud of the fact. And uh, it is a good omen. I truly believe then the anticipated good days will come to women. The country will also progress with women's participation is uh, the hope and belief. Interestingly enough, when I was uh, during this campaign and many times when I interact with young women, uh, young women getting educated, uh, you know, we are all very proud and confident of, confident of ourselves. Many women asked me, um, why do we need the women's bill? Why do we need quotas? Can't we, you know, just go out, get it on our own talent? Well, we tried. It didn't work out. So we were pushing for the women's quota, and it now finally is a reality. And uh, India has a great experience with quotas. When in local governments, we gave women uh, the reservation of 33%. Now in every state, almost every state, one or two states are the exemptions. The women participation at the local governance level has gone up to 57%, 55%. So the quota started from 33, but the participation of women has increased and it has gone to 57%. I'm particularly very proud in my state of Telangana, uh, oh, many municipal chairmen, many municipal vice chairmen, many Zilla Pursuit chairmen, approximately about 55, 57% of them are women. And uh, also proud to say that Almost 92% of them are from my own party, BRS. So that is the support that we enjoy in the grassroots level and very, very happy. And one other important thing uh, we should all uh, really note about the Indian founding fathers, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, Dr. Jawaharlal Nehru, Mahatma Gandhi ji, who gave us the voting right without even asking. Many countries, including the uh, UK, USA, Japan, Women here had to fight for decades. I remember um, uh, one of the speakers, honorable speakers, was mentioning about in 1928 how they passed a bill of women's suffrage. But in India, we did not have to ask for the women's rights. The visionary leaders thought about it, understood that women have to get the voting right, and we got the voting right. Well, we started off very well, but somewhere we were off the track a little bit, and we are really hoping that we will come back. You know, women are often told a lot of things. Um, be a good mother, be a good uh, wife, be a wise mother, etc. But unless and until we are in the leadership positions, I don't believe 
women of the next generation will be inspired enough to be whatever it is, good mother, wise mother, good wife, whatever it is. If you have confidence that, you know, I have a future, I can share my ideas on platforms where it matters, then I believe women can be best at whatever they do. This, this is, I say it with a lot of pain. In fact, I was trying to understand, analyze, uh, you know, multiple times that what happened? Is there any species in this whole nature which subjugates its own female species? I think human beings are the only exemption. You know, if there are 10 people um, in the room, five female, five male, how did, how did the five started dominating the other five? You know, what has happened in the evolution of human history? These are serious questions that we really need to think about. We really need the support of the world-class intellectuals to think, understand what happened. Why, why is this only there in human race? How can you beat up your fellow human being? How can you take all the work without paying a single rupee from a woman and expect her to be loyal, patient, smiling, good-looking end of the day? How is this even possible? And how come men, without any communication whatsoever, centuries back, managed to do the same thing in every damn continent of the world? I don't understand that. It is beyond understanding. This is really something that we should get to the root of it, solve it, and take it from there. Because today I might, I might be a member of parliament. That's all right. But look at how many lakhs and lakhs of women are denied and deprived of their opportunities. Why is that happening? Uh, we have a wonderful reservation in the local governance. We have about 14 lakh women, but most of them, even today, they're not independent in being their sarpanch. That is why the terms like sarpanch, pati, etc., are in, uh, you know, invented. The sarpanch is a woman, but the pati, who's a husband, he attends the meetings. So these, these are bound to happen. But then, yes, that is the first step, and then from there we will move on. But it is a serious question for all of us, especially the young girls sitting there, to understand, is there any other species in this whole nature which does that to its own kind? And where are we wrong? Where did we go wrong? How to correct it? I mean, I say it out of a lot of pain, not um, just as a matter of fact, because we hear stories. In, in Japan, uh, women were pra officially, by law, banned being a part of any Member, any political party or political activity for thousands of years. They fought for a hundred years to just get the membership of political parties. China, women were chained, caged to look good, you know, to have a certain uh, 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 statistics to be maintained. The kind of atrocities that were done on women, not easy. How are we going to go back? What are we going to do? How are we going to give our girls that confidence is what matters. And that is something that we really need to think. And in terms of future, there are many uh, thinkers here. There are many young participants here. I really want you to think about this. If any future technology is coming up, for example, artificial intelligence, that is a buzzword now. Everybody is talking about AI. Artificial intelligence now still is called black box technology because not many know what's happening in there, what is going to come out of it. But uh, as a computer science engineer, I can tell you, artificial intelligence now has passed the stage of learning, understanding. It is now at the stage of generating stuff. It is generating art, it is throwing speeches at you, it is giving you phrases, it is giving you opinions, so it is learning. But from a woman's perspective, I really worry and we really need to think, what is it learning from? If you are learning from the toxic material that is available online today, will the AI treat me good? As a woman, as a child, am I safe with AI? Today, some chatbots created, they harass the hell out of women online. A woman, if she speaks her mind online, is harassed. If these machines are learning from that toxic material, what are they going to treat us like tomorrow? And how do we regulate these technologies? We really need to put these laws in place. Because AI now is getting converted into ACI. It will be a capable, intelligent machine. It will start doing things. Now it is analyzing, you know, generating stuff. Tomorrow it will start doing things. So what will that do to the women? of the world? What will that do to the children of the world? These are certain things that we really need to think about. And another thing, I'm um, very on a lighter note, I'm a, a hardcore fan of intermittent fasting. I've taken up intermittent fasting four or five years back. 
I was reading, I was understanding. I'm a person who has to understand, uh, otherwise I would not do anything just for the sake of doing it. So when I was trying to read, understand, I've read many, many research reports. Not one was about women. In healthcare, a, a, a very interesting fact like intermittent fasting, nobody is researching on what intermittent fasting does to women. It's only a couple of years back I found few people who wrote books on how intermittent fasting works for women. So when I read a book called Fast Like a Girl, then I really took it up. Then I really understand. But now for the people sitting here and sitting down, should we not understand if the tons and tons of money that is being pumped into health research is only to research about men's health, what about women? Are we not important? Or should we not as a policy legislate and say that you should look into both of these matrices? So there are, I mean, it pains me to say, but as policymakers, we really sometimes, I think, ignore women's needs and women's um, issues. And I can just go on. I can just go on about many, many things. Uh, we were also researching about how startups work. Uh, first of all, if there are 10 startups, only maybe 1.5 to 2 are women-led startups. And then when you look at the access to finance to the women-led startups, it is dismal. They do not get the finance. Only men-led startups usually get the finance. And what are all of us doing? The MPs, the ministers, it could be male, female, the political parties, doesn't matter. All of us are guilty. But these are certain things that we should really look at. When I say women's, uh, women's bill, women's reservation bill, it is not only to make 181 women as member of parliament. It is about making the billions and billions of women. And mind you, I'm saying this with a lot of pride. When we talk about women, countries don't matter. There are no borders. Across the globe, I don't know how men managed to subjugate us for centuries as the say, at the same rate. Now the time has to come, time has come that women across continents should connect, should talk about issues, should take up these issues. If today India has passed a women reservation bill and some other country does not have that bill, I think it is a duty of Indian women to go help our sisters there. Unless and until we find some bond like that, I don't think we will progress. Uh, men in the room, I'm so sorry, I have such strong opinions, but please get used to it, to hearing many more strong opinions from many of our sisters, because it is time. You've, you've literally, we've been ignored for thousands of years, it is time. And I'm very, very glad in India the time has come. Well, there are certain um, tiny bit, little bit lacunas in that bill uh, about the implementation, the time frame, et cetera, that we will discuss domestically. But one aspect of the bill which should be discussed internationally as well, uh, within the women, if you are reserving 33% for women, how are, are we making sure, because I've seen Manjuji mention about many communities, that representation of women from all those communities is there or not. For example, in India, in this bill, OBC community representation is missing. So I believe OBC community representation also should be added in this bill. We will, of course, fight it out in our own country. But uh, other than that, this is a wonderful first step for women. This is, uh, uh, this is something that will affect the world in a greater way because we are 70 crore women. We are getting a chance now to get up there, go to the parliament, get up there, stay in the assembly to make laws that will strengthen our democracy. So I'm very happy that this has happened. Uh, I, in a very small, tiny way, was able to contribute to it. And I'm very glad that I got attached to this cause. I could do my bit. And uh, all the political parties, all the leaders, uh, especially my leader, KCR Garu, has been very, very, very inspirational and very pivotal in uh, making sure that this bill passed. Because not only now, 10 years back, he gave his commitment. 10 years back, we passed a resolution in our state assembly asking the central government to pass the 33% women's reservation bill. And today it has become a reality. We will, we will make sure the bill touches the lives of every uh, women from every strata. And I'm really glad that I'm here today in London speaking about it. Uh, we look up to much more opportunities like this, not only for me, but many more women here. As I said, women of the world, it is time we should get united. But on the other note, I just want to ask a uh, very uh, interesting a, a question because many of us are Indians here, most of you are citizens already. Uh, well, it is cricket season now, ICC, and UK is the defending champion. I'm rooting for India for sure. Whom are you rooting for? <laughs> you know, <laughs> how do you deal with that dilemma? I always wanted to ask you. 
the UK is a defending champion. I think yesterday we were supposed to start the event, but it will happen soon. So um, I'm just hoping India will get the World Cup home this time. So you... <laughs> Thank you so much. And I also come from land of Kohinoor, so I really don't want to miss out this opportunity. Well, there is a discussion about Kohinoor happening and it will go on forever. It, it's, it's all right. But I just want to ask you, sir, Virendraji, you should also maybe advocate towards this. If you don't feel like giving us the Kohinoor back, it's all right. At least give us back our Vijay Malia. You know, what is he doing there? With that note, thank you so much, guys. It has been wonderful. Thanks a lot.